Welcome to the Sports Watchdog Radio Show, hosted by Mason Kern. He keeps his nose to the ground to report on what's trending in professional and college sports, to inform, enlighten, and entertain. And now it's... The Sports Watchdog! The Sports Watchdog, Mason Kern. Hey everybody, welcome to the Sports Watchdog Radio Show on NBC Sports Radio AM 1060 Phoenix. I'm your host Mason Kearney with you every Sunday and as always I do have some great stuff in my kennel guys, some great interviews today. The first one, stay tuned for it, it's with Brandon Noble, the former NFL defensive tackle. As well we'll have on uh, John Eisenberg who is a former NFL columnist, author of 9 and now 10 books as you'll find out in the interview to come and Really exciting stuff for you, as always. I mean, we got the Super Bowl later today, so we'll have some interesting stuff from that for you. And we'll also have some the always interesting happenings on the Hardwood segment, so stay tuned. It's going to be a great show. Can't wait for it. <laughs> All right, guys, in Sports Hot Topics this week, like I said, I mean, we got the Super Bowl later today, so I don't think there's a hotter sport topic than the Super Bowl. We'll just get into a little preview for it here based on my own kind of projection of, of how the game is going to go and, and kind of what I've seen just throughout the, the season now. Obviously, I mean, who doesn't play fantasy football here? I mean, I, I do, first of all. And I had Todd Gurley on my team. That was a monster all year. I, I mean, love to have him. Um, disappeared kind of in the la- the Rams' last playoff game a little bit. So it's going to be really interesting to see um, where he kind of fits in because he's obviously such a large part of the Rams' offense um, in terms of point production, yards per carry, and, and, and yards after contact. Um, even in the passing game, he's somewhat of a threat. So going to be really interesting to see if he can step it up in this Super Bowl, especially against a good Patriots run defense. Um, you can never really count how Tom Brady. Um, I know he seems uh, up there in age, but he always seems to find a way to make it to the Super Bowl um, and, and win those Super Bowls, obviously coming back against Kansas City um, a few years ago and, and – it's just th- these are two I think dynasties. Whereas the the Patriots are are in I mean they're already an established dynasty. Whereas the Rams are kind of an up and coming under Sean McVay, and uh, with Jared Goff at the helm, Todd Gurley um, running the the RB one position. Obviously, um, the Patriots if they get stopped here, maybe Tom Brady retires. Maybe he doesn't. Um, I, I've heard that he probably won't. Um, just based on reporting from from various other sources. Um, But when you look at this game, it's going to come down to whose defense is better. They always say defense wins championships. So I'm really interested to see which defense steps up. Can they stop Tom Brady? Can they stop James White out of the backfield? And and can the Rams' defensive line put pressure on the quarterback? Um, that's also going to be something to look for. Um, if, if you give Tom Brady enough time, he's going to end up finding um, a, an open Gronk, an open Edelman, um, these guys who are offensive threats and weapons who the Rams are obviously preparing for. But pressure on the quarterback is going to be a crucial element here. And uh, the Super Bowl, I mean, forecast, I don't know if I want to put it out there because, um, like I said, you can never bet against Tom Brady. <laughs> Don't go anywhere because we'll be right back after this. If you're losing your hair or notice that it's getting thinner, listen closely. You can do something about it without messy lotions or drugs. Now you can get clinically proven hair growth results at home with the HairMax Laser. HairMax delivers nourishing laser light energy to stimulate hair growth right at the roots. It's FDA cleared, recommended by doctors, and best of all, it has an amazing 93% success rate in clinical studies in both men and women, so you can be sure it works. Use it just three times a week and experience new hair growth, increased density, and healthier, fuller, more attractive hair in just weeks with a five-month money-back guarantee. Now, for a limited time, save 15% on your HairMax order at HairMax.com. Type in code RADIO at checkout or call 1-800-9-REGROW. That's HairMax.com code RADIO or 1-800-9-REGROW. Experience real hair growth and save 15% with HairMax. Hey everybody, welcome back. You're listening to the Sports Watchdog Radio Show on NBC Sports Radio AM 1060 Phoenix. I'm your host Mason Kern and joining us now is Brandon Noble, the former NFL defensive tackle for the Dallas Cowboys and Washington Redskins. After leaving the NFL, Brandon coached at the college level at Coastal Carolina and Temple University. 
Now he's a college football analyst for College Sports Life and the co-host of 215 Live, a sports radio show. In June 2017, Brandon served as a spokesperson for the MRSA Survivors Network, an organization formed to raise awareness and educate the public about MRSA. Brandon played college football at Penn State and was named second team all Big Ten following his senior season in 1996 before moving to the NFL. So with that, Brandon is here to share some details into his football career as well as his involvement with the MRSA Survivors Network and what that all entails. So with that, hey Brandon, welcome to the Sports Watchdog Radio Show. So glad you could be here today. How you doing? I'm doing well, Mason. I appreciate it, man. That was, that's, it's always interesting when, when you listen to, to your life back, you know, <laughs> kind of told back to you. And you go, oh, yeah, I did that, and I did that. And uh, hope they don't want to talk about that. But, no, yeah, I, I appreciate it, man. I'm excited to be on today. Yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time. So, first off, before I really get into anything else, I'm always curious to just ask professional athletes and former athletes just how they got into their sport in the first place. So you playing in the NFL, what was your kind of first start in football and how did that kind of progress to it becoming coming a, a job for you? Well, you know, well, so like, like most, uh, you know, kids at about four or five, I saw a football game on TV and I thought, boy, that looks like a lot of fun. I think it was, right. if I recall correctly, it was the Chicago bears and the green Bay Packers. It was probably somewhere around 1978 or so, because I happened to be living in Chicago. I was about four years old. Um, and, uh, you know, I just saw it, and I was like, wow. Like, that looks like a lot of fun. Now, the funny thing is, like, my mom wouldn't let me play football until I was in, almost in high school. So I was in the eighth grade because she didn't want me to get hurt. Right. No worry. Um, mine too. <laughs> yeah, right. And, so, and then she wanted me to be a kicker. Um, and okay. I, I, out, I outgrew that position exponentially. <laughs> but uh, – but you know what, man, I, I was just – I've always loved the game, and it's always been a huge part of my life, whether it was just playing in the backyard with my buddies uh, or playing, you know, my first year of Pop Warner, which was a bit of a punch in the face <laughs> when all of a sudden you show up. And when you show up in the eighth grade, right, and you're playing with kids in Pop Warner that have playing since they were, you know, in the second grade, right. a, they, they know what they're doing and you don't. And uh, I definitely got lit up more times <laughs> than, uh, than, I, than I care to remember. That first year was uh, – was rough, but it set me on the right path. I uh, it got that year over with, and then I went on to uh, to play high school ball. And, you know, for me, it was never it was you know the dream of playing in the NFL was there, right? But it was always just kind of one step at a time. I, I was I think fortunate to be able to grow up before social media and kind of all of the stuff we got going on now. I watched my own boy go going through the recruiting process um, and how long it's taking. Like for me, it was just kind of like okay, I just want to be a good high school football player. And then right. I just want to, I want to find a college that'll let me play for them. You know what I mean? And then I end up at Penn state. And next thing you know, it's like, man, I, I may go to the NFL. And then next thing you know, you know, nine years later, I'm retiring. So uh, I'm really, really fortunate to have been able to live that dream. Uh, but it was definitely a long process. Yeah, I'm sure. And I mean, obviously all the, the training and everything that that comes with getting to the, the pinnacle and the elite level of the sport. I mean, that that's pretty taxing for sure. But I also am just curious because you obviously you go from high school to college playing Division One at Penn State, have a lot of success success there. But how is this the transition from going from Division One football, which is obviously a lot a lot tougher than high school, but then that jump to the NFL where it's an even a, a higher level of the sport? It's the, you know where the transition is. It's hard. So the the first time you go out on an NFL football field. Uh, at practice, right? And you're probably not even in pads. And you realize how fast these guys are and how big they are. And then you go out to a preseason game and you go, holy smokes, <laughs> this is the fastest football I've ever seen in my entire life. Like, it's just it's the blur. Ball snapped and it's just a blur. Uh, and then you get to the regular season, it's even faster. And if you get to play in a playoff game, it's even faster, which is amazing. But really the biggest, Mason, honestly, the biggest transition, the hardest thing to grasp is the mental side of the game. Right. And, and right. learning how to become a pro, how to study the game, because look, you don't in college, you don't watch. I mean, look, these kids now, they have access to film a little bit more than I did. I'm going to date myself a little bit. Like we used <laughs> VHS tapes. Right. There was no huddle. I didn't and some people phone. probably don't even know what that is. I know. And I'm going to make go Google it. Use your phone <laughs> and Google it. Um, but but so, like, you know, we didn't watch a lot of film. We watched it. And we had the 20 hour rule. So you were. You went to practice, you watched some tape, you watched practice. But, like, when you get to the NFL, man, it is – you go in in the morning, you start watching tape, you're looking forward to getting out on the field for the walkthrough and the practice because if not, you're just sitting in a dark room studying. Right. But, I, but for me, that was where I learned 
I learned the game, and it also is where I was able to really flourish. Like for me, look, I'm a six foot one and three quarters, 300 pound nose guard in the NFL, and I am not the fastest guy, the strongest guy. I'm not a creature. Do you know what I mean? I'm not. I'm not Aaron Donald. I'm not <laughs> Dominican Sue. Right. Like I'm none of those guys. But in the film room, in the meeting room, in the study, when I when it came to those kinds of things, that's where I got my edge. And thankfully, I was around some guys like Chad Hennings and Leon Lett and Greg Ellis, who were old, older pros, and they showed me how to do that in Dallas, which I'm super fortunate for. Right, yeah. I mean, having that kind of mentorship, especially, I mean, coming in as a rookie and then just progressing throughout your young career, I mean, I'm sure that was instrumental in kind of some of your success. But like I mentioned in, in kind of the intro, you're you're involved with the MRSA Survivors Network. What, what is your kind of personal uh, experience with this, and, and why did you get prompted to kind of supporting this this initiative? Well, you know, so MRSA ended my career. For, for those of your 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 listening audience don't know what it is. Right. Uh, it's basically a staph infection that you can't cure with normal medication. They have to bring out the big guns. Uh, and wh- when I when I got it, it was something that no one really talked about. No one really even acknowledged very much. And th- there was a string, or kind of a, 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 a yeah, I guess a string of, of guys in the NFL right around 2004, 2005 when I first got it. That that all of a sudden people started talking about it. And so I got involved. I testified in front of a Senate subcommittee hearing. Uh, it was really cool. I mean, I was in D.C. I was playing for the Skins when I got MRSA. Um, and it, and it, MRSA ended my career, like I said. It, it basically, it's an infection. Um, and from that, I ended up having to have multiple surgeries. I was on all these heavy, heavy, heavy antibiotics. Right. Um, and then I eventually threw multiple blood clots into my lungs. And my wife was like, that's enough. You're done. Um, and, uh, and so, so I, it, it obviously, it became something that I learned a lot about, not because I wanted to. And then I started meeting people that were really, really affected. I mean, look, I could have died a couple times. I had MRSA twice. The first time was very, very serious, life-threatening. The second time they got it early. Uh, and then the, the, the blood clots almost killed me again. But, like, you realize how close my wife was to being a widow and my kids were being, you know, to being a father, you know, not having a father. And I started to meet parents that had lost their kids. And I started to meet, uh, you know, you know, you know, bro- you know, people that lose their parents because of it. And just, you know, it's just a terrible thing that nobody talks about. Uh, and so I got involved with the Infectious Disease Association, uh, the MRSA Survivors Network, and now I'm, I'm partnered up with Clorox uh, to kind of talk about ways, you know, that you can prevent it because it's still around again, and nobody talks about it. I got, I got three kids. Right? All of them play sports. Two of them are football players. They live in a locker room. I mean, I stay on top of this because I know what it almost did to me when I was, like, in the peak shape that you could possibly be in, right? I mean, like, 28 years old, professional athlete, and it almost killed me. Right, yeah. I mean, definitely, I mean, an expi- an inspiring story for sure, coming so close to that kind of brink and then being able to, to survive, bounce back, and now leading kind of this, this cause, this effort, and, and being an inspiration to others, definitely uh, really inspiring and, and cool for sure. So what what are kind of some of the initiatives that you, the organization, kind of do to spread this awareness and make sure everyone kind of knows the risks and dangers? Well, yeah, I, I think the big one is, that, and again, this is where, you know, again, my, my partnership with Clorox has been really good because it's really common sense, right? And it, it's about it's about just doing things like your mom told you for years and years. Just wash your hands, right? Now, if you're a boy, that's not always the easiest thing to do, right? We're dirty by nature, <laughs> um, and uh, especially if you're an athlete, right? Then you're going to be that way. But you know, the big one is just wash your hands, soap and water. Especially like again, if you're an athlete or you've got an athlete and they've had some sort of practice or some sort of physical activity and they're not able to, maybe they got to jump in the car and go do some homework. They just wash your hands. Right. The other one is, is again, kind of common sense. Wash your clothes. Wash your sports equipment. You know, you if it if it's if it's bleachable, use some sort of, of EPA recommended you know bleach in there. Again, it has to be white. I've bleached enough dark shirts to know not to do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, I've I've had um, my fair share as well. Exactly. Exactly. Um, another one, man, is is to just again common sense, right? Just wipe things down, especially this time of year when you got people in and out of the house, man, using something like a Clorox bleach wipe, you know, to, to knock down the, the, the countertops um, and also the, the door handles. I know that when, when I got sick, uh, one of the things that my wife used to do all the time was she would go through and, and you know, and behind me almost, um, you know, wipe down door handles and things that I had touched 
uh, before, you know, as I, as I move through the house. And then the last one, you know, is really, uh, you know, be vigilant. I mean, if you get something on you, if you look, if it looks bad, go to the doctor. If you start to feel sick, go to the doctor because they've got to get on top of that really, really quick. Right. Once MRSA, once MRSA gets in you, it goes fast. And if it gets into your bloodstream and you can get septic really, really quick, and then you're in a world of hurt. Um, and then the last, again, the, the last, the last, the last one for real, don't share stuff at the gym, right? Don't, don't grab your buddy's towel. So obviously nobody shares razors anymore, but, right. uh, you know, and it's all common sense, right? And those are just really easy ways that you can kind of, you know, eliminate some of the risk, uh, you know, the, the, that comes with being an athlete, being in a locker room, or even just being around the house. And, uh, you don't want to contract that thing, man. MRSA is nasty. Right. I'm, I mean, coming from someone who obviously has experienced it, for all our listeners, take the advice. Definitely some great <laughs> stuff from a firsthand source right there. Brandon, we really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks for taking the time. Where can our listeners go to get more info or just connect with you? Actually, you know what? Uh, hold on. I think you can find me on Twitter, bnoble75. Um, that's probably the best place to find me. You know what I mean? Look, and if, you, if you've got questions, you know, obviously go, you know, ask your your health care provider, jump online, Google it. I mean, I joked about the VHS tapes, but uh, <laughs> we've all got a tremendous amount of information right in our hands most of the time. Um, but, but be visible, you know, especially if you're a parent with kids involved in athletics. It, it's important, and it's simple to, to, to stay on top of it. Right. Well, there you go, guys. All right, everyone. The Sports Watch Radio Show on NBC Sports Radio AM 1060. We'll be right back. Hey, travel lovers. If you want to up your luggage game, check out EagleCreek.com, an innovative and durable line that's sustainably made with PVC-free materials. One stellar option is the Orf Trunk 36, a big bag crafted for big adventure. It's hard to find upright luggage that puts as much into durable and useful features as this one does. Built with all explorers in mind, the Orf Trunk 36 is lightweight, dependable, and efficient. With wet and dry compartments, multi-point handles, a cargo net for internal compression or outside gear attachment, puncture-resistant lockable zippers, central lock point security, oversized treaded wheels, padded laptop sleeves, and more, this luggage seemingly has it all. It even has a key fob quarter key bottle opener. Plus, there's free shipping on all orders and a no matter what lifetime warranty. Shop now at EagleCreek.com. That's EagleCreek.com. Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to the Sports Watchdog Radio Show on NBC Sports Radio AM 1060 Phoenix. I'm your host, Mason Kern, and joining us now is John Eisenberg, the renowned NFL columnist and acclaimed author of nine books, including the, That First Season and Ten Gallon War. John has recently authored a new book titled The League, How Five Rivals Created the NFL and Launched a Sports Empire. And he's here to share more info on that, as well as talk a little bit about the upcoming Super Bowl. So with that, hey, John, welcome to the Sports Watch Radio Show. So glad you could join us today. Uh, well, thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time. So like I said, author of nine books, you've just written a, a tenth one. What kind of prompted you, first off, just, just to kind of write uh, another book? Well, I've written some books about uh, earlier NFL history. Uh, I grew up in Dallas. I wrote a couple of books about the early days of the Cowboys. And uh, I wrote a book about Vince Lombardi's first season in Green Bay. And I've always sort of enjoyed going back and taking a, a fresh look at things. And, and an editor in New York called me and said, would you like to write about the early days of the NFL? And I said, well, sure. It's a great, very interesting time. And he asked me, what's the story? You tell me what the story is. And I focus, wound up focusing on, once you dig into the early days of the NFL, it's, it's really staggering to realize uh, how much this league struggled for so many years. And I thought I would focus on that. Just uh, today's uh, readers would not believe how much the NFL struggled. And it wound up focusing on the five owners who, who basically carried the league for 20, 30 years and then eventually set it up to succeed, to, to come out of that difficult era and succeed. Uh, later down the line and of course today it's just an unparalleled success so I I thought uh, readers today would be interested in knowing how much this league struggled back then right and and because you were approached and and you were kind of given the whole uh the whole I mean leadership aspect of of creating the whole story as you kind of try and think of a story idea how do you then narrow down okay this is what I'm going to focus on and then narrow it even more to to focus on five kind of key individuals well, that's a good question because the question was, 
to me, okay, I'm going to focus not on the players but on the owners, the guys that were basically running the league. The question is which one. And right. I did leave some guys out. I mean, I left out Curly Lambeau, who's, uh, you know, and it was, uh, I mean, Lambeau Field, the Packers player, right. and he's an, an integral figure. But uh, when you really study the minutes from those meetings, which, which you can read at the Hall of Fame, uh, they have a research library there. If you read the early minutes, well, first of all, Curly, he didn't own the Packers. Their community owned as they are today, so it wasn't his money. Uh, and he just wasn't involved as much in sort of the league direction as these other guys were. So after a while, you winnow it down, and you really can't see the guys that made all the key decisions. Right, and and so you, you finally, I guess, narrow it down. You, you get kind of the five guys you want to focus on, the, the owners, and, and that kind of shapes your story. So why then did the story, or, or how did, like, choosing these guys, how did, why were their stories the ones that kind of reflect the larger story then of, of kind of 20th century America as a whole? Oh, well, it's definitely 20th century America. These these guys are all, they're nothing like today's owners. Uh, today's owners, of course, are titans of industry and their teams are worth billions of dollars. Right. And, and uh, these guys were sons of immigrants. Um, they, they were from, uh, they didn't have a lot of money. I mean, Burt Bell, who started the Philadelphia Eagles and later was commissioner of the NFL, he came from money. The rest of them did not. These were sons of immigrants, working class. They worked their way up a little bit to the point where they could buy a team and start a team. Of course, not a lot of money to do that. So it's really no different than, as I look at it, like uh, and, you know, an immigrant, an immigrant tale. It's not different than Henry Ford in the car, you know, in 20th century right. America, or the guys that did the the cathode ray tube and started television. I mean, this is a pro football. I mean, it is not as integral to society as, as those things, but as a sick, as a success story, it, it, it does parallel. And, and that's what these guys did. Right. And then having, I mean, kind of the ability to tell these guys stories and, and, and as an NFL columnist yourself, like I, like I mentioned earlier, what has been kind of just the maybe a favorite story uh, either in the book or, or elsewhere that you've kind of experienced having covered just the NFL for such a long period of time? Well, certainly in this book, the stories that struck me, I mean, we're talking about George Halatier who started the Chicago Bears and his family still owns the Chicago Bears. His daughter owns the Chicago Bears. Uh, she's still alive, wow. uh, Virginia. She's 96 years old. They're worth $3 billion now. But uh, if you go back to, say, George, he was trying to get it going in the 20s and the 30s, uh, especially after the stock market crash. I mean, the, he, to keep the Chicago Bears alive, he won uh, one offseason, robbed his – didn't rob, but he asked his kids, can I borrow the money in your college savings account? Wow. And, and they said, yeah, we'll do it. Virginia, she told me this story. And so they were really, I mean, he was taking money from college savings accounts. One year, he didn't have money to pay his players. And these are famous players, uh, Bronco Nagurski, Red Grange, iconic names. He gave them IOUs instead of salary <laughs> one year because he, he just didn't have the money. Right. And, and what was really incredible is they took the IOUs. They said, okay, we'll, we'll go for that. So the stories like that are just so much uh, in conflict with what we see the NFL as today, and I, I just found it fascinating. There's many, many stories from that era like that. Right, and and kind of in terms of that difference from today's owners versus those uh, in the 20th century that you're kind of highlighting in this in this book, what makes the these owners kind of so different, and why were the owners of of before able to succeed in the in kind of different ways that the owners of today are? Well. They, what these guys did was work together. Uh, it, it's important to understand that there was very little money on the table, no television. Uh, you know, there was no television yet, very little money from radio. It was just ticket sales or ads for programs, and it wasn't very much. So they understood that even though the dynamic was this, even though their teams were rivals, we're talking the Bears, the Giants, the Redskins, they were trying like crazy to beat each other. They understood that they were partners in the business of pro football, and they had to work together. Uh, the co sense of collaboration was incredible. I, I don't think you see that in the NFL today. Uh, one example, a great example, the best example is the draft. All right, I mean, you get to like the mid-1930s, there, there was no system for distributing talent. 
it was just college player. You ended your eligibility, and everybody bid on the players, and the best guys went to the rich teams, the Giants, the Bears. And so Burt Bell, who started the Eagles and couldn't get any players, they were at the bottom of the barrel, he stood up at a league meeting, and he said, um, gentlemen, I'm going to be out of business here soon, and, and, and you might be too because we're going to have a boring league if you win all the time. We have to come up with some way to level the playing field. And the teams that had everything, I'm talking – Hallis and Tim Mara, who started the Giants, they immediately saw, you know, he's right. And so they went with the idea of a draft, even knowing that it was going to undermine their success. And never again would they dominate like they did, but it would make the league as a whole better. So, uh, you know, putting the greater good ahead of everything uh, is, a, is a wonderful ability, a wonderful knack. And these guys did have it. And uh, I'm not so sure you see that in the NFL today. Right. Well, definitely a really interesting story there. I'm sure there's so many more in the book, but we're running out of time. John, thank you so much. Where can our listeners go to get more info, find the book, or just connect with you? Uh, well, I'm on Twitter at Bmore Eisenberg, uh, and uh, I write the daily, or uh, not daily, but a couple columns a week at BaltimoreRavens.com, and the book is available anywhere, Amazon, BarnesandNoble.com, any bookstore, major distribution. So, yeah, anywhere you'd want to get a book, uh, uh, you can find it. Well, there you go, guys. Once again, the title, The League, How Five Rivals Created the NFL and Launched a Sports Empire. John, thank you so much again for your time. All right, everyone, the Sports Watchdog Radio Show on NBC Sports Radio AM 1060. We'll be right back after this quick break. If you're tired of hair falling flat, check out the NPBeautiful.com Flat Iron by celebrity hairstylist David Babai, known for Kate Hudson's beachy waves. This sleek modern iron is curved, allowing for endless styling options like waves, flips, curls, and ringlets. Innovative rose gold vibrating plates heat up to 400 degrees, shuffling the hair back and forth to minimize tugging, slipping, or pulling. And 10% of net proceeds support pediatric cancer and animal welfare causes. Find it at NPBeautiful.com. You ready to hoop it up? This is Happenings on the Hardwood. All right, guys, it's your favorite segment. It's Happenings on the Hardwood. I mean, you guys know it's my favorite segment. And this week, a lot of talk, obviously, about Anthony Davis um, putting in a trade and, and or a request for one. Got fined 50000 for making it public in the way that he did. Um and, and kind of LeBron courting him, uh, sources are saying he wants to go to L.A. in 2020 and anywhere else will be a one-year rental next year um, in, in terms of trade packages. Uh, the Knicks have also come out as a front runner of a preferred destination for Davis. Um, but that, that whole drama, that whole saga, wasn't even really the biggest news piece this week because later in the week, uh, the New York Knicks and Dallas Mavericks have agreed to a blockbuster trade. Um, there was a Woj bomb on Thursday, and it was a, it's really shaking up the league a little bit. Uh, Christoph Porzingis uh, met with New York executives and, and the GM and, and said basically that the culture um, does not really suit him. It doesn't seem like uh, anyone really wants to win. I'm obviously paraphrasing. Um, but uh, so he kind of left the New York Knicks a feeling that he would rather prefer to be traded elsewhere. Um, and, and not really even hours later, Christoph Porzingis is not a New York Knick. So the Dallas Mavericks uh, sent a package of Wesley Matthews, DeAndre Jordan, Dennis Smith Jr., who was already on the trade block, um, and two future first-round picks in exchange for a New York Knicks package of Christoph Porzingis, uh, Trey Burke, Courtney Lee, and Tim Hardaway Jr. Um, so definitely shaking things up. A lot of good role players. Obviously, DeAndre Jordan back when he was in uh, L.A. with the Clippers um, with the kind of big three there with him and Blake Griffin and Chris Paul. Uh, Lob City was, was a pretty dynamic force uh, at center. So we'll see if he can make an immediate impact in New York. Uh, Dennis Smith Jr. was already kind of uh, on the trade block after the emergence of, obviously, Luka Doncic playing so well this year. Um, and then Wesley Matthews, another another kind of, I would say, underappreciated shooting guard um, who can who can make some things happen. Trey Burke averaging 11.8 points per game this year. Um, he's a serviceable backup guard uh, for Dallas, uh, who will back up Doncic, obviously. Um, and then Courtney Lee and Tim Hardaway Jr. I would say Courtney Lee's more the vet. Won't probably see as many minutes, but he'll still get his time in. Um, and then Tim Hardaway Jr. signed a pretty big extension last year, um, and, and he'll play that out in, in Dallas the remainder of it at least. But he is pretty streaky. You can, if you can't 
contain him, he'll go off for 30 on a night. So some, some good pieces for both teams, but the Kristaps Porzingis era is done in New York. He is currently injured, not playing right now, but... Once he does, I mean, a, a European star duo of Doncic and Porzingis is pretty formidable. And then, obviously, with the remainder of Dirk Nowitzki's uh, time in Dallas, um, training them up, it'll be interesting to see how that chemistry uh, progresses. Well, that's a wrap, everyone. Anybody wanting to connect with me, the Sports Watchdog, on Twitter can do so at a Sports Watchdog, and on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube as well at the Sports Watchdog. So until next time, keep your eye on the ball. The Sports Watchdog. The Sports Watchdog, Ace and Kern.